Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Virtual Student Experiences Season 2 webinar. Today's webinar will focus on cardiology. If you guys are new to our program, Virtual Student Experiences is a pro bono initiative spearheaded for students by students. We at Virtual Student Experiences want to be the inspiration for aspiration. Our goal is to give students around the world an opportunity to hear from professionals in their career industry of interest in a friendly and casual setting. And if you're a student that knows what you want to do in the future, we at VSC want to encourage, allow, and connect you with professionals. The VSC students are given the chance to decide if their career choice fits their personality, skills, and really overall interests. Through VSC, you'll be able to hear from a wide variety of guests from a wide variety of seniority levels. To find out more information or to be notified about other webinars, you can visit our website at www.virtualstudentexperiences.com. And before we get started, I just want to let you guys all know how this is going to work. So firstly, I'm going to be asking our guest professional that I'll introduce in a second, a series of base knowledge questions so that you can get a good idea of who she is and what she does. And if at any time you think of a question, feel free to post it in the Q&A module and we'll get to it in the later part of the webinar. We highly recommend that you guys ask questions during this webinar because it's really an opportunity to get an answer right here, right now, instead of reading about it later on the internet. And just quickly, reviewing our VUC core team of volunteers, we have Becky, Gabby, Jonathan, Coco, Tommy, and Audrey. And now for our guest professional today, we have Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali began her medical career as a certified nurse and then attended medical school, completed internal medicine res residency, and then completed a fellowship in cardiovascular medicine and is now a very successful cardiologist and award-winning physician writer. Dr. Ali received her BA in molecular biology and history at Vanderbilt University, followed by a doctor of medicine degree also at Vanderbilt. She then underwent an internal medicine training at the University of Virginia before returning to Vanderbilt for her cardiology fellowship. During her cardiology fellowship, she also obtained a master's of science in clinical investigation and pursued a special fellowship in advanced cardiac imaging, as well as completed advanced training in preventive cardiology, nuclear cardiology, and echocardiography, cardiography, becoming the first and so far the only fellow at Vanderbilt to do so. Dr. Ali has also served as the Director of Preventative Cardiology and Director of Echocardiology at Murray Medical College, an independent medical consultant to many medical companies, an obesity expert, and a physician editor. She has also been a medical writer for over 20 years, and currently she holds the position of President at Last Sky Writing LLC, as well as the positions of Consulting Scientific Director at M Health, Medical Review at Very Well Health, Very Well Fit, and Very Well Fit Mind, Medical Review at Health Central, Physician Writer at OMCA Incorporated, Assistant Clinical Professor of Medicine at Vanderbilt School of Medicine, and Chief Editor of Anasclerosis and Congenital Heart Disease at Medscape Reference Drugs and Diseases from WebMD. She's also at work on a variety of commercial writing projects, the cur most current of which is a narrative history of the Waverly train disaster of 1978 and its effects on medical emergency response teams today. As we can see from her plethora of accomplishments and positions and achievements, Dr. Ellie is a very successful and well-known cardiologist and has worked very hard to be where she is today. We're very glad to have her today. So thank you so much, Dr. Ellie, for joining us. Well, thank you, buddy. I'm excited to be here. And thank you to Beckett Wren, who was uh, my first contact with VSE. I appreciate you all reaching out to me. I think it's a wonderful service that you're doing for your fellow students, and I'm delighted to be a part. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, just to start it off, can you tell us about what a cardiologist is and how you got into that field? Yeah, so a cardiologist is a heart doctor, uh, but more than that even. So cardiology is the study of the heart, but over the decades, it has evolved to be a specialty that deals with the whole cardiovascular system. So that's the heart and all the blood vessels. And there are many different uh, subspecialties within cardiology, including electrophysiology, which are, they're the folks who uh, deal with abnormal heart rhythms, um, interventional cardiologists who put in stents for people who are having blockages in their coronary arteries. Um, there are cardiac imagers and preventive cardiologists like myself who read um, imaging studies that are done on patients to find out if they have problems with their heart before they may need to go to the next step or to determine what kind of medications they need to be on. Um, uh, preventive cardiology, as I mentioned, is, um, 
the field of cardiology that is specifically aimed at preventing heart attacks and strokes and preventing um, all the suffering that, that comes along with them. So um, that's what I focused most of my career on. Um, there are heart failure specialists. There are lipidologists, which I also am, which is the study of cholesterol. So many preventive cardiologists take a special interest in cholesterol because that's a, um, a big uh, factor in causing heart attacks and strokes. Um, there are what are called congenital heart experts who deal with the structural changes from congenital heart defects and help manage those patients. So it's a huge field. Um, what a cardiologist is not, though, is a surgeon. So I want to make that clear because a lot of people often assume when I say I'm a cardiologist that I'm a surgeon. Surgery is a completely different field. Um, there is cardiothoracic surgery and cardiac surgery, and that's a completely different training path. So cardiologists are all subspecialists first of internal medicine. So we study all of the organs in the body, learn how to treat all of those internal medicine problems with medications primarily, as well as some procedures, and then become cardiologists. We do not do a surgical residency first, which is what cardiac surgeons and, and thoracic surgeons do. So a surgical residency is what it sounds like. It's all about doing surgeries, opening up the body and treating it that way. So I wanted to be sure that students understood that distinction because a lot of people don't. Um, and then what was the second part of your question? Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for providing that clarification. Uh, can you tell us about how you got into that field and where your interest began for that? Yeah, you know, I was very fortunate in that both of my parents are physicians. My father is a general surgeon and my mother is an internist and gastroenterologist. And they uh, ran a clinic in Waverly, Tennessee, which I'm sure we'll get to later in, in this talk. Um, and I, as a certified nurse assistant, would be uh, able to work in their clinic at times and would be asked to do electrocardiograms, ECGs, which is where you put electrodes on the chest to get the heart rhythm of a patient. And so I would be asked to do those um, for, uh, for their patient. And then I would, um, I would always be interested in, you know, what my mother, who was usually the one reading the ECGs, what she was learning from them, what she was understanding about a patient's heart from these squiggly lines on, on a piece of paper. So I got really interested in cardiology when I was in high school, as a matter of fact, senior in high school, just like yourself. So um, when I went to medical school, when I studied uh, anything that had to do with the heart in anatomy and physiology and, and all the rest, it just really grabbed me. I just loved it. So, so I knew pretty early on I was going to be a cardiologist. And I, I aimed, in fact, to go to an internal medicine residency that had also a strong cardiology program that was known for strong so that I would have um, exposure to those cardiologists when I did my cardiology rotations with that program. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And then were there any special requirements or prerequisites that you had to meet when you went into that field? Yes. So to go to medical school, um, so I should step back because most people have to take the MCAT to go to medical school. I was part of a special program uh, through Vanderbilt College of Arts and Science where they took about 10 people which were called early acceptance to Vanderbilt Medical School. And if you were accepted early as a sophomore, then you didn't have to take the MCAT if you wanted to go to Vanderbilt. So I knew I wanted to go to Vanderbilt. I wanted to stay there. And so I didn't take the MCAT. But most people will have to take the MCAT and get qualifying scores. And the higher the scores, the better your chances of getting into a good medical school. Um, for my path, it was, as I said, it was a little bit different. And then in medical school, I was a top student. I was in the, uh, I, you know, I met the requirements to be in the Medical Honor Society, Alpha Omega Alpha. And um, that sort of thing helps build a resume when you go to residency and then eventually know you're going to apply to a highly competitive subspecialty fellowship like cardiology. So then I made sure I went to a good internal medicine program and kept uh, in touch with my contacts at Vanderbilt, which is where I was hoping to return for cardiology. So, um, so you know, I think this will be a theme throughout all of the uh, all of the presentation and all of the medical presenters that you talk to. You have to have good grades and good study habits 
from high school onward. I mean, you really can't let that drop. That, that has to be very steady, a very steady commitment. Hmm. And then is it super important to go to a name school like Vanderbilt? It's not super important, not, not at all. Um, it probably makes things a little bit easier when you're uh, sitting in that interview room um, and the interviewer has already seen that you've gone to uh, a highly respected school. But I know many excellent physicians who started out at, um, at colleges that weren't in the top tier and uh, they've, they've done fine and they were able to get into great programs later on. So it's not, you know, it's not absolutely necessary. Does it help your chances? Yeah, but it's not absolutely necessary. Hmm. And then can you speak to maybe some of the most important lessons while you were in college um, that you took away that still really help you today? In college, so I'm, I'm thinking back a ways here. Um, you know, what helped me the most in college that has stuck with me today is actually developing my writing skills. So as you mentioned, I have a BA in molecular biology and history. And of course, you know, going the pre-med route, um, you have to take a certain number of science classes. You don't have to major in a science, but it helps. And it certainly helps when you go to medical school. So the molecular biology part helped going to medical school and, and understanding, you know, uh, a lot of the science classes that you have to take in, in medicine. And it has helped me recent, very recently with my role as a consulting scientific director. But I would say my uh, history major made a tremendous impact on me, maybe even more so than my science major, because uh, it was with my history major that I learned to read and comprehend huge, um, huge tomes of text, which you have to be able to do when you get to medical school, as well as write about them, summarize them, and, and, and do some critical thinking and convey your thoughts and be able to communicate. And so my role today as a medical communicator, which is what a medical writer is for the most part, that probably has its roots in my history major. And you know, the history major at Vanderbilt required 36 credit hours when I went through it, which was one of the longest programs, you know, the, the, the largest number of hours in the college. And, uh, and so you had to do a lot of writing. There were a lot of term papers and you had to learn to crank them out. So, and that's, that's helped me as a writer today more than anything. Hmm. And then I guess, yeah, those are some things that helped you um, to get to where you are today. But when you were looking at your first few jobs and going through that initial process of getting those internships um, and your first few jobs, can you speak to maybe some of the skills that helped you um, get those few, first few jobs? Well, in medicine, it's a little bit different when you talk about first few jobs. So do you mean, um, do you mean getting into a residency or a fellowship, or do you mean my first jobs after, you know, after finishing training? Mm -hmm. I guess it's a, it's a full process. So if you could take us through um, both going into the fellowship and residency, and then after that, going into uh, getting a job. Yeah, so... Um, so in interviewing for, uh, for residency and fellowship, I think, you know, having, having a strong resume, having um, proven, uh, you know, that I had the grades and that I had good scores um, and good recommendations from my clinical attendings, as well as um, having a history of research, of doing research, applying for research grants and publishing in um, the peer-reviewed medical literature. So I had already done that in medical school. That was huge in, uh, in making, a, uh, making for me what was a good resume um, in the, the eyes of my interviewers. And it put me ahead of a lot of other people being able to do research in medical school. So I would say to anyone who is considering going to medical school, do look for a medical school that involves its medical students in research from the get-go. As a first year medical student, we were all required to take our second semester, you know, to have, I think, every Tuesday and maybe every Tuesday afternoon, it might have been every Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, dedicated to a specific research lab. And, and that's great when you, you know, when you're able to learn from a, uh, an established scientist, an established medical scientist, and you can then get your name on papers that follow, you know, that follow you the rest of your life, really. 
Um, so my history of publications goes back to uh, 99, 1999, because of my medical school experience. Um, so that, that put me ahead. Then in applying for my cardiology fellowship, um, uh, because I was interested in research, I put in an application at the same time to obtain my Master of Science in Clinical Investigation, and that helped my cardiology fellowship application as well, because they were able to say, okay, here's someone who not only wants to be a cardiologist, she wants to be a clinical scientist. She's interested in our MSCI program as well, and we only have a certain number of slots for that, and not everybody's interested. So, so that was a good niche for myself. Um, and then in getting my first jobs, that had to do with the advanced training. Uh, so you see a theme here, getting, getting ahead of the game and getting advanced training and things makes a difference later on. So my first job had to do with running an echocardiography lab. Echocardiography is, an ult is ultrasound of the heart and directing a preventive cardiology program. And that came out of my seeking out that advanced training during my cardiology fellowship for cardiac imaging, echocardiography, and preventive cardiology. So that made me qualified to do those things. And again, not a skill set that everybody had. So, so that helped set me apart as an, as an applicant. Hmm. That's really amazing. Um, and then more down the line when you started to become more of a physician writer, can you speak about um, some of the skills and responsibilities you held as a physician writer? Yeah, so um, again, my history major, having done all of the writing of those papers during, <clears throat> during that, uh, that period of study at Vanderbilt came into, you know, into play, <clears throat> as well as um, being a cardiologist. That turned out to have a, to play a big role in my medical writing because um, <clears throat> a lot of companies at the time were looking for cardiologists who could also write and there weren't many, at least not at that time, um, as well as that Master of Science degree I told you about. So, you know, all three of those things together really helped make me a strong candidate uh, when it came time to look for medical writing jobs because I had, you know, I had medical communications experience. I knew how to write. I knew how to write well. And I knew the science. And I was in a super, um, uh, super desirable, subspecialty, which was cardiology. So it, you know, it, at the time, um, there just weren't a lot of people doing what I was doing. So again, you know, finding a niche for yourself, I think becomes very important in creating opportunities. Hmm, that's awesome. And then I guess looking at your current piece of work with the uh, history of the Waverly Train disaster of 1978, can you speak about that project? Yeah, that has been a labor of love because, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in Waverly, Tennessee, and um, in 19, February 1978, uh, one of the uh, most devastating train explosions of the 20th century occurred in my hometown, and my parents were the physicians uh, staffing the emergency department in Waverly that day. So small town of 4,000 people in rural Tennessee with, dealing with a devastating catastrophe. And, um, you know, because of their presence there, the work of the physicians they worked with, as well as um, the whole medical team that all came together along with emergency medical personnel, you know, firefighters and uh, police officers, they were able to save quite a few lives that otherwise would have been lost. And so I, I kind of grew up with that story, uh, but it wasn't until about 10 years ago that um, uh, one of the police officers who had been involved in the, uh, the explosion, I ran into him in the hallway of my parents' clinic and he started talking and he started telling the story about the Waverly train disaster again. And, and this time, I was really interested and I started asking him questions and that led to more and more. And I thought, whoa, you know, this would make a great book. This is a story people should hear about. And it has implications for, for all of American in infrastructure, you know, uh, and for emergency medical response and for how a rural healthcare system um, is integral to uh, the functioning of a community. And I, I just saw all kinds of possibilities for it. 
And so I began doing interviews with all the survivors and looking into the research. And, and it's, you know, it's now 10 years later. And, uh, and I finally uh, have a literary agent and we are seeking a publisher for, uh, for to tell that story, you know? Well, that, that's really amazing. I, I congratulate you on that. Thank you, thank you. And again, you know, my history major, my history major has everything to do with making me qualified to tell this story and, and know how to do oral histories and interviews and know how to, you know, know how to write. Uh, a history and a historical narrative. But I would also say being in medicine, being a doctor helps a great deal with this as well, because I understand what happened with the triage in the emergency department and how the burn victims were treated. And I can tell that story in a way that people can understand that uh, that's accessible to me as a physician that I can then make accessible to the general public. And it also helped when I was doing my interviews with the survivors that I had a lot of patient care experience, you know, sitting across from a patient asking them questions about their medical history, about, you know, how do you get the answers you're looking for from someone um, in the language that's best for them to use. So, uh, so that helped a lot with my interview experience as well. Hmm. It all ties together. It's, it's actually pretty cool. Most definitely. And you're obviously very experienced with really decades of, um, decades of, work and different experiences and even your education you have a very diverse education how do you how do you continue to make progress through all, all of after all of these years oh you just never stop you never quit you have to love learning um when i was a, in my second year of medical school at the very end of our preventive medicine course um which would have been you know close to May, close to everybody sort of getting out for the summer. Um, Dr. Bill Schaffner, who many people will have seen in the news because he is an, a, a preventive medicine specialist at Vanderbilt who has been tapped quite a bit to speak about the COVID-19 crisis and, and pandemic. He was our, one of our preventive medicine instructors at Vanderbilt. So we we're very fortunate in the, the people we had teaching us. And he flashed up as his final slide this quote that has now become part of my email signature and I've never forgotten this quote from uh, San Isidore of Sevilla. Live as if you'll die tomorrow. Learn as if you'll live forever. And that's what has guided me as constantly learning and always being curious about the world and always thinking about how can I use the knowledge that I learned to help other people. So that, that combination, curiosity and compassion has, has been, you know, my guiding force, I would say, you know, all my life. Hmm, that's really awesome. And I know um, you mentioned before that now that the coronavirus has taken over, you're focused more on writing. Um, so can you maybe speak to the top three skills that you use as a writer? Sure. Uh, discipline. Discipline is a big one because uh, you have to make yourself get to your desk and write or get to your notebook and write. Um, so so that's, that's important. Um, and I think anybody, you know, who's watching this who wants to go far in life, who wants to be a professional of any kind needs to um, cultivate that sort of discipline in whatever field you, you choose, uh, you, you're gonna have to have some, some discipline and time management skills. So, so discipline is one. Um, fostering creativity is another, and part of that has to do with what you mentioned, my interest in many different fields. I, I try to read across a broad spectrum of, of interest and um, try to be knowledgeable in, in many different things. And I find that that often sparks ideas um, and different perspectives that I can bring to my writing. Um, and then I would say the third, the third is simply uh, attention to detail. So I tend to be a very um, detail-oriented writer, meaning that I, you know, I, I'm really, um, I'm really strict about my grammar 
about proofreading, about you know, my doing my own editing before I send before I send a copy of anything to anyone, I want to make sure it looks great to my eyes. So I don't just, you know, slop something down and send it out. Um, uh, you know, I, ha having been an editor for so long, I, I bring that to my writing as well. So, yeah, so I guess that, you know, attention to de attention to detail would be the last one. Amazing. And then can you speak up, can you speak to some of the, maybe the challenges that you face coming up in the industry through all of your years of research work um, and how you really overcame those challenges? Yeah, you know, I, I want to say first, for the most part, I have been so fortunate in my life and I've been uh, blessed with um, the best opportunities, the best education. Um, so I, I have really started off, started off on a great foot and was able to maintain that, thankfully, and my health has been good. And I'm so, I'm so fortunate in those ways. I will say in cardiology, we have an issue, um, the whole specialty does, in that only 10 to 15 percent of practicing cardiologists are women. And that has not changed much in the 20 years since I became interested in cardiology. So that, um, that can be difficult at times. I was very fortunate to have both male and female mentors who, um, who helped me when times got tough. And, and in fact, some of the ones who helped me the most were my male mentors. So, um, so it's not prohibitive by any means, but I think it helps a great deal for women in medicine who want to go into a specialty if they see other women who are in that specialty and if they have other women who can role model the, all the different ways, you know, you can be a woman in cardiology. Um, and I just didn't have as many role models as I would have liked from that perspective. Um, so, so I guess that, you know, that was difficult um, at times, not always, but at times. And then, um, I think, you know, having an interest in, in medical writing and having an interest in creative writing um, doesn't always work well with being a full-time practicing physician. So there were choices I realized I had to make and I had to decide, you know, where I wanted my career to go. And whenever you're at a point where you have to decide on, you know, which career or where in your career you want to go, those are difficult moments, but they're really important to navigate and, and touch base with yourself and your heart and what you really want to do. Um, because, you know, life's just too short to spend it doing things you're not meant to be doing. And then, thank you so much for that. And then before we go into the student questions, which we have a couple of, um, can you just offer some final words of wisdom to aspiring writers and aspiring cardiologists? Final words of wisdom. Uh, yeah, for your audience, I'm particularly speaking to those in high school and college, work hard, uh, get good grades, study, study, study. Um, and before you go into medicine, and especially in the cardiology, which is a long training path and a hard field, make sure that's what you want to do. So shadow someone, find a way to shadow someone or talk to someone in that field before you go into it. So make sure before committing yourself. Uh, and I'm available to any of your students who want to contact me. Uh, they can find me at my website, yasmineallemd.com. That's Y-A-S-M-I-N-E-A-L-I-M-D.com. And they can just you know contact me through the contact form there. I'm happy to answer questions from students. Awesome, that's really awesome. I'm, I'm sure students will be happy to take advantage of that um, most gracious for, uh, offer that you so kindly offered to them. And then now focusing on some questions that they have currently, um, they just are wondering what skills you use when refining or your writing or what tools do you employ when editing? Uh, well, my eye. I mean, I'm not really sure what to say other than I go over it with my own eyes very carefully. And I use Microsoft Word as my, um, you know, to write my manuscripts as my uh, document uh, platform. And Microsoft Word is very good at catching spelling and grammatical errors, errors, but 
it doesn't catch all of them because there are words that you can put in that make sense to the computer in the program, I mean, in your document, that when you read it again, that's not what you meant to say. So you do have to read it line by line yourself. And a special technique that I use and that I recommend other writers and authors use is if you're working on something very important to you, read it back to yourself out loud. Read every word and you will, you will see how it sounds to your ear and see, see whether or not that's really what you meant to say. And you will catch every mistake when you're reading out loud. And then what role does research play in your writing? What skills do you utilize when conducting research and how do you maintain reputability and factuality? So research tools that I use depends on the writing that I'm doing. Um, and I'm gonna go back again to, to what's most relevant, I think, to, um, to high school students and college students, and that is learning how to use uh, keywords and search terms. And uh, there are, uh, at least when I was, when I was in school, um, it was usually library programs that could help you do that. So your school librarian or your college librarian, you know, your college librarians would often offer free courses um, on how to, how to search online libraries and how to use your search terms and activities and exercises you could do. That might seem boring, but that has helped me tremendously uh, over the years, being able to hone into, um, into the right search term, the right keywords to find, you know, to sift through the hundreds of millions of articles that are online. So, you know, how do you filter through them and get your top, you know, get your top uh, um, documents or your top hits um, without spending hours doing that? So, um, so, knowing, so knowing how to do that is a great skill to cultivate, and that's something that has helped me. Um, making sure then that the sources I use are factual and accurate uh, and credible. That also has just come out of my experience as, you know, through my training to become a physician and to, uh, in my research in medical school, um, knowing what uh, what medical journals are reputable. And then later on uh, in my um, job as a medical editor and physician editor, I uh, got to learn uh, about impact factors, which is something that uh, ranks medical journals on, uh, you know, what their impact is for the entire medical community worldwide. And the higher the impact factor, the, the more credible the journal is. So it means that the scientific community respects that journal highly because they have a rigorous peer review process. They don't let just anything in. They, they um, select only a very few articles based on the best um, research methods. So some, some examples would be uh, The Lancet, um, the New England Journal of Medicine, the British Medical Journal, um, the, in the uh, cardiology world, the European uh, Heart Journal and the uh, circulation, the Journal of the American Heart Association, those are some that have the highest impact factors. And so knowing that means that when I get results from those journals, I know I can respect them. Then when I'm looking at, you know, other journals, how do I decide whether or not a study is something I want to include um, or something I want to trust? That goes back to um, some of the statistics I learned uh, in medical school, but mainly to my Master of Science in Clinical Investigation, where we had several biostatistics and medical writing courses that taught us how to read the medical literature and how to read the methods section of a paper to see whether or not, whether or not it was a good study design that would give you know, good results that would give results that you could believe. And then you can look at the statistics that go along with them and which everybody should be publishing with their papers. And if they aren't, it's not a good paper. So you can look at the statistics that are published and decide for yourself whether or not, uh, you know, yeah, this is a credible result. This is valid. And then you also learn to, um, you also learn which institutions put out great medical information, both for professionals and for the general public. So for instance, the American Heart Association website is one that I go to a lot. The American College of Cardiology, the NIH, uh, National Institutes of Health, um, 
the CDC on many topics, the um, World Health Organization on certain topics. So you get to learn, you know, which institutions are strong and which diseases you're, you're looking at. Awesome. And then last question from these students. What is your mindset when writing medical-centered papers? Does it differ from paper to paper? So I didn't catch that again. The connection's a little scratchy. Say that again, buddy. What is, what is your mindset when writing medical-centered papers? Does it differ from paper to paper? You know, um, it does differ depending on what kind of paper I am writing. If it is a research manuscript, then um, my mindset is look at the data first and how do I tell the story of what the data shows. If it is a, um, a case study or a case report, then it's, um, you know, what is the finding, again, what is the finding that I want um, to highlight here? If it's, if it's a review article, a review article is a, um, usually a summary of the most recent literature on a topic. For instance, I want to write a review article on treatment for LDL cholesterol, the current guideline then my approach is going to be to cover as much as I can in as succinct a way and highlight the most important pieces for the practicing clinician. Um, so, you know, so it, yeah, it does differ from paper to paper and it's all, the common thread is who is your audience and what is the story you want to tell them? Hmm. Well, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge experiences and stories with us here today at Virtual Student Experiences. I'm sure the students that were here today are, have greatly benefited from what you were able to share with us here. And I'm sure that the students that will view this even later on will be able to benefit from your uh, very diverse experience and very well knowledgeable experience as well. Um, so I just thank you so much for coming on as a Virtual Student Experiences guest. Thank you so much, buddy. Thanks for having me and uh, all the best of luck to you. and to your panel, and to your listeners. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye.